This is Around the Table, where we explore the benefits of cooperative ownership. This week, we're recording live at the Commodity Classic 2023 in Orlando, Florida, and we are going to talk about the legislative landscape for agriculture. We're also going to talk a little bit about sustainability. We're going to start by introducing our great panel for the day, folks. On this end, we've got Jesse Allen of the American Ag Network joining us. Jesse, thanks for being here. You bet. Thanks for having me. We also have Will Stafford, who serves as the CHS Washington representative. Will, thanks for being here. Thank you. And Megan Rock joins us. She is the Chief Sustainability Officer with CHS. And Megan, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. And of course, Greg Horsmeyer, Editor-in-Chief at DTN, joins us today. Greg, he has a lot going on here at Commodity Classic. There certainly is, and it's great to have some time to talk about it. Over it here. is. It's great really to be here, nice. Thank you. We're going to start, Megan, with you. I want to okay. talk about sustainability. It's a huge topic. Let's start with the current landscape in agriculture. Where do we sit? What are the areas of discussion for sustainability today? It's a, it's a great question, and you're right that sustainability can get big very, very quickly. I like to describe it as having tentacles. You, know, you can start with emissions, you go to yield, you go to input, and next thing you know, you're talking about policy. So it can, it can grow very quickly. So I would say right now, the, the hot topics are carbon, data, and probably traceability. And the thing about those three is that they're all interconnected and they're relying on each other. So if you start with carbon, of course, everybody's talking about emissions, uh, start carbon sequestration, uh, decreasing um, what's going into, into the air. But that, to do that, you have to start with data. And the data starts at the farm level. But of course, then you want to transfer that all the way through the supply chain from the farm gate all the way to the downstream user. And so you need traceability as well. So that's probably the top three. And then from there, like I said, you get those tentacles and there's a lot of different things happening there. But those are probably the top three. Now, when you think about it from the farmer perspective, Megan, as you mentioned, huge topic. It's on discussion, not just in corporate boardrooms, but on farms across the country. And what's coming back your way? What do you hear from farmers on sustainability? You know, the one is, so I think we, I think you might have mentioned that I'm fairly new to CHS, just coming up on a year. And one of the things that was really exciting for me about coming to CHS was being closer to the producer has been doing sustainability for, for some time. And I've really felt that in these conversations, producers' voices were not being heard. And over the past year with CHS, I have had the opportunity to get out, our, you know, talk to producers at our annual meeting and some other events. And I think the number one thing is wanting a voice, being a part of the discussion. When you're talking about carbon and data and traceability, making sure that producers is are there sitting at the at the table i've also heard that this is really confusing there's a lot of different terms there's a lot of different words and it changes quickly you know i live in this every single day i'm able to keep up with the trends but if you're not in it every day these words can change very quickly and that can be hard to keep up with and then i would say that the other thing is and i and i'm not a i'm not a producer but this is again this is what i've been hearing is to, to, to take in what is already being done, to consider that mm. in ag, on the farm, efficiency is the name of the game. You're talking about yields, fewer inputs, not putting more into the soil than you have to, you know, to get better yields. So if we can talk about it in that way, I think that's what probably the main messages that I've been hearing from producers. That is a great point, Megan. Jesse, do you have a question? I was just gonna say, I, I will agree with you on that, that I think, from what I hear from farmers ranchers, the biggest thing is confusion. A lot of them don't understand what this all encompasses when we talk carbon, for instance, with sustainability and everything else. And that's, I think, why there's a lot of reluctance to, to your point. I, I think that is probably the biggest issue that I hear from, from farmers, Megan. I, I, I would agree, Jesse. One of, one of the things that we did at CHS uh, since I started is we did what's called a materiality assessment. It's basically just a sustainability assessment. You engage your stakeholders, both internal and external. And that was exactly what we heard is it changes so quickly that it, there's, a, there's a hesitancy to get too involved because you don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Is it going to change with the, the administration, which I'm sure if it will, you, know, you can talk about a little bit more and probably better than I can, but is it going to change? Is, it, is the, the topic of the day going to change tomorrow, next week? So I, you know, being very, very clear um, 
and, and helping to define some of these words and then the trajectory of these of these initiatives would be really helpful, I think, for, for, produ for producers. <laughs> Absolutely. Having a common language that we can use to discuss this, that everybody's on the same page about would certainly help a lot. Will, as Megan mentioned, these topics start in the farm field. They work their way up to D.C. Sustainability, yep. definitely a hot topic in Washington right now. Where does that conversation sit today? What are we seeing? Yeah. So as the Biden administration came into office uh, and, and Democrats controlled both the House and the Senate, um, we saw sustainability really in climate in general, really ramp up in um, as just kind of a popular topic um, that everyone was talking about. Um, and late last year uh, in the last Congress, we did see a couple of things happen. We saw a, a bill called the Growing Climate Solutions Act uh, get signed into law. That was a very bipartisan bill that CHS was supportive of um, that helps kind of add some of that certainty and break down barriers so that farmers can participate in carbon markets. Um, and we've also seen some action by USDA um, that's been very farmer focused and farm, farmer forward, um, which kind of goes to what Megan talked about and something that we had been advocating for. Um, and we kind of saw that come to fruition in some of these climate smart partnership grants that USDA uh, put into place last year and are still um, working through uh, as we speak. So uh, that's been very exciting. Um, and then obviously we have the next farm bill coming up uh, as well. And we're looking to see how sustainability is going to play a role in that. Um, it's still taking shape. We're still seeing how some of these debates are forming. Uh, but um, there is a coalition called the Food and Ag Climate Alliance that CHS is members of through some of our trade associations like the National Council of Farmer Co-ops. And they actually put together a list of about 100 sustainability and climate recommendations that they released a week or so ago. Um, and some of them are really important to co-ops and I think our owners, like ways that we can assist USDA um, and NRCS with some of their staffing concerns um, and using the co-op system as technical service providers, for example, um, looking at how we can better partner through programs like the RCPP program in conservation. And then Megan uh, mentioned some of the folks that are doing the sustainability practices already, just making sure some of those early adopters get rewarded are just a few things that we're looking at. Sustainability, crop insurance. Is there going to be some more linkage in this next farm bill, do you think? Uh, well, there's been discussion about that. Um, there was a, uh, a GAO report, that's the Government Accountability Office report, a couple of weeks ago now um, that was commissioned by a member of the House um, that asked about that specifically, and it did recommend um, tying climate smart uh, practices to crop insurance, um, which would probably look something similar to uh, what happened in 2014 when they tied crop insurance to conservation compliance. Um, we have pretty uh, clear um, policy goals at CHS that these programs should remain voluntary. Um, and uh, I guess it would probably depend on who you ask, but I would not consider that um, voluntary adoption um, for farmers. Good point, Will. Greg, voluntary versus mandate. These have been hot topics of conversation here in agriculture. And how should folks be thinking about return on investment when we're uh, thinking about sustainability? That, that's a really good question. We've had several panels that we've done at some of the events that we have bringing farmers together and people who are providing carbon credit programs. And it always boils down to return on investment. I mean, I think it's nothing. No surprise that farmers want to do what's right. They, they want to do the right things. They a lot of them are adopting these practices anyway, trying to, as Megan was getting to, reduce the footprint, reduce the amount of products that we have to use out there in the field. That's all part of return on investment. That's 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 helping my bottom line, helping keep my margin strong. When it comes to the programs themselves, I think that's that's what a farmers have a lot of question about. What will I have to do? What, back to the statement about voluntary versus versus mandatory, what will I be required to do? What can I do? And then what does that mean to how it works on my farm? And I think that's one of the encouraging things that I'm beginning to see is as this, I don't want to say that this whole idea has matured because it's a long way from that, but it is maturing, um, that the programs that I see coming up, the things that I see uh, programs like that CHS is putting together, are trying to not shoehorn everybody into one shoe. They're trying to think about each farmer's operation, what needs to be done there, and try to be as as wide ranging as they can be. I think, and and that I think gets farmers' interest. When you tell them you have to do these things, okay, mm, can I do that? But when you say, well, how would this work on your farm? Tell me how you can make this work. That's a whole other conversation. 
I, I think to add to your, your point there, Greg, and, and we can all kind of talk about this mandatory versus voluntary side of this, I, I think of as an example in, in Iowa, the nutrient reduction strategy, a voluntary program, more people took part in that because it was voluntary. You know, I think we know a lot of farmers and ranchers, if they're told to do something, they're not going to be as receptive as they are when they have the option to do something. And I, I think that's very key in this whole discussion. I, I'll let you guys talk about that. Greg, maybe you, you have yeah, I think there. I think that's right. I think, I think, in, I mean, voluntary is, is, I think, the way to go. Incentives help, though. I yeah. mean, let's face it. Why do we have, why did we have a lot of, uh, uh, cover crops pop up during the equip years because there was money to help make that happen. I think, you know, it, it, it's farmers are working with what they have. They've got their operations running. Whether you're asking them to do something different or you want them to do something different, they are going to have to change that. If there's some kind of an incentive, whether it's in the form of government aid or whether it's in the form of reduced to input prices or whatever, um, suddenly, okay, that gets my attention. You know, when I want to go buy a new car and there's an incentive for me to do that, I'm interested in doing that. Absolutely. And Greg, you made, you, what you said made sense because there are barriers in this implementing a lot of these practices are going to be changes in their operation. It's going to be work on the farm that maybe isn't paid for in the commodity price necessarily. So there's got to be another way to make it pencil. Will, to that end, we have had assistance from Washington, D.C. on a lot of these issues in the past. Do you anticipate more funding coming for helping farmers tackle some of these sustainability issues? Yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly interest in it. Um, and, and the fact that so many agriculture groups have coalesced together and in forms like the Food and Ag Climate Alliance to, to say that the voluntary carrot approach uh, rather than the stick, if you will, um, is what farmers want, um, has been listened to by USDA. And again, I, I think that manifested itself pretty well so far with a program like their Climate Smart Partnership Program. Um, and, you know, we obviously have yet to see the results that have come, that will come and, and probably won't for some time from those grant programs, but very voluntary, very farmer focused grant programs. Um, as far as, as farm bill policy goes, I mean, the, the restrictor plate, if you will, um, is always going to be budget. Mm -hmm. um, we are, are working mm -hmm. within a, a tight budget for the next farm bill. Um, the Congressional Budget Office just a few weeks ago now released a new score for the next 10 years, and um, it was higher than I think folks had hoped for. Um, but, you know, there were some extra funds for conservation in the Inflation Reduction Act at the end of last year. And watching to see how those funds may be allocated within this next farm bill is going to be one of the bigger debates I think we see. That's an interesting point. So those funds that were allocated in the IRA last summer, they don't yet have a home necessarily until they're specified where they go in the farm bill? Correct. I mean, this new farm bill is a chance um, where those funds could go elsewhere in the bill. Um, you know, I think the debate on whether they should stay within the conservation title or not will happen. Um, and I think the debate with within the conservation title, assuming they stay in there, um, and where the best place and the best use for those is going to happen as well. And that's just part of being in a tight budgetary environment. You've got a lot of groups and a lot of members from all over the country that have their own priorities and, um, and want to see something happen. And with such a tight pot of money and anywhere you add in the farm bill, you might have to find somewhere to subtract from. Um, you know, any, any dollar figure is going to be um, tightly contested, I would All say. Right. It is a give and take, and it always has been. It just it feels like, to your point, with this tight budget, it almost feels like this farm bill could be a heavier lift this time around than it has been in previous years. Yeah, and, you know, I, I've always said, and, and I've worked on the last two, and, and on the last one I was up in the Senate working for the chairman of the Ag Committee, and no farm bill is easy. I can tell you I did not celebrate the last one being done until it was signed into law. Um, they can <laughs> fall apart at any time. No farm bill is easy to get done. There's always a tight needle to thread. Um, but I do think that we have the leadership um, in both the House and the Senate to be able to get one done. Um, on the House side, you've seen GT Thompson really lean in as new chairman. Um, even the new Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, has said that they intend to get a bill done this year. And then on the Senate side, you know, you have Debbie Stabenow, who has been in charge on the Democrat side of the aisle for the last three of these bills, I think now. Um, and uh, and John Bozeman, they work really well together. They've got the experience, they've got the leadership that, um, you know, I do think we have a good shot at getting one done this year. 
All right. Megan, I want to bring it back to you. Bring the focus back to sustainability. Yep. As you mentioned, your position's been out there a year. You've been driving this headlong. Where do you see it going from here for the cooperative's efforts to help make sure that the rest of us can, can stay sustainable? Yes. Uh, so I, I would say that the very first thing is to understand the, the needs of the cooperative system and for producers. We, we've talked a lot about these practices have been done and we've been doing sustainability for generations. It's just now that we have this word sustainability and we have ESG and all these other buzzwords. So I, that really is the first step that we're taking as an organization is engaging our stakeholders and understanding where we should go based on their feedback and identifying those gaps between internal and external stakeholders to make sure that we really are moving in, in the right direction. We, during, during the, the materiality assessment, sustainability assessment, we did speak with some of our member co-ops and there is definitely an appetite for this, but it goes back to, to your question, Jesse, about, well, this is confusing though, too, at the same time. And this is, I think, a really important role that CHS can play is to be the mediator, you know, help to take sustainability and make it mainstream, make it uh, a word that makes sense to the entire agricultural cooperative system and create opportunities and market access off of that. So that's, that's where I see it going. I think sustainability will become main, mainstream and not such a, such a buzzword, but it really will become a, a critical part, a, a critical spec, just like any other bushel of corn, wheat, or, or soybeans. Megan, since we've got you here and sustainability is so hot right now, if we've got farmer listeners who are hearing these conversations, they're going, gosh, everybody talks about it, but I don't know what they're talking about. Is there a way that, that CHS is working to reach those farmers and to educate them on, on the glossary of words that we've got in this space? Or is that something that could be coming? Well, we, we have done that so far. Well, first of all, just being here today, uh, being here at Commodity Classic, talking with, with you all. But our second annual sustainability report, which we published in November of 2022, if you take a look at it, it's available on the CHS website, you'll see that that report is written for our owners and it's written for producers. And we have these call out boxes in that report that define some of these terms. And so for a sustainability professional like myself and many other you know, chief sustainability officers, you know, that's, that's old stuff. But we know that it's new to so many different, you know, to, to so many people. So when you go to that report, you'll see these call out boxes that define sustainability, that define ESG, define carbon. And we'll continue to do that. I, I've, I've been able to, to get out and do, like I said, um, interviews like this. I've talked at different CHS events, the annual meetings. So more and more getting out and being one on one with producers. It's so what it all comes down to. We've got to be on the same page if we're going to have these massive nationwide conversations. So really grateful to see CHS yes. working to keep that information in front of the grower. Yes. Greg, I want to turn to you. Since we've got you here, you are, of course, editor-in-chief, one of the premier news organizations in the world of agriculture. You also do a little bit with weather. Uh, what are you expecting to see this spring? Well, before I answer that, I need to re recognize that I'm, you're about to ask me questions that I'm not an expert in, but I understand <laughs> that true. Megan actually has a background in meteorology, so really? i got to be really I careful am. what oh I say Oh, my here. goodness. Well, yes. quiet down. Greg, Megan, tell us what's coming this spring. <laughs> it's been a while since I've looked at some maps, but yes. <laughs> but uh, we're Well, one of the things that we've been looking at in, on the weather side is this as farmers will know, the, the loss of a La Nina condition and sort of moving into this neutral condition, which means there's really nothing in charge. So we've been, as everybody knows this winter, we've been going through these cycles of systems just rolling through. It gets warm, it gets cold, it gets warm, it gets cold. We're expecting more of that through March and through April. So we're expecting what my staff meteorologist, uh, John Berenick calls an active weather pattern. So just constant change moving through the system. What that means in terms of sustainability is wetter weather in a lot of the, of the Corn Belt this year. It means cooler weather potentially in a lot of the Corn Belt this year. And that means to me, narrow windows for planting. You know, thinking about sustainability, thinking about erosion control, thinking about not spraying the burn down right before it rains and that kind of stuff. The windows are going to be a little tight this year, I think, if we if we put a, a, a fine point on it. And so what we've been telling our readers is pay attention. This is a year when you got to really watch, watch those weather systems, have everything ready to go. 
you know, have the sprayer ready to go, have the planter ready to go and, and hit it when you can. Yep. I think that's very true. And I'll, I'll add to your point with weather and having those tight windows, being prepared, but also being open to doing things. I think that's the biggest thing for a lot of farmers going into this spring is being open to doing some of these sustainability efforts on the farm and, and not just saying, oh, well, I'll do it next year. Oh, I'll do it next year, kicking the can down the road. At some point, if you're going to do it, you have to jump in and do it. And I think that's the thing that, that farmers need to just keep an open mind, I guess, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's certainly a, a trend that I'm hearing from folks around the table is try stuff. Right. Yeah. Get out there this yep. year. Try something fresh. Will, we're preparing for an active spring, no doubt, in Washington, D.C. For our audience here, from a farmer and rancher perspective, is there going to be sustainability topics in D.C.? Other than the farm bill, as we get into the spring, what needs to be top of mind? Yeah, I mean, for ag, I, I think the farm bill is going to be the big one, um, and especially in a, in a split Congress um, where not a whole lot is going to be able to move, mm -hmm. um, and the farm bill might be one of the few pieces of large legislation that does move this year. Um, I think that's something that they should certainly be looking at. But outside of that, um, I think watching how USDA does move forward with their Climate Smart Partnership programs is really important. The implementation of that Growing Climate Solutions Act by USDA that I mentioned earlier that helps break down some barriers for farmers um, to join some of these uh, voluntary carbon markets, I think that will be something that is important to watch. USDA is going to have to put together an advisory panel, um, and I would love to see co-ops um, well represented on that panel. I think I'm sitting next to someone in Megan Rock who would be great on that herself or someone from her team hint, hint. Um, if, she's, uh, <laughs> if she's too short on time. But, um, but I think it would be great to have CHS and, and co-op representative representation on something like that. Is it still possible to get the co-ops represented or have those committees all been set? Oh, I, it's absolutely still possible okay. to get them represented. Um, and, and I think USDA does, does value the partnership with co-ops and realize that we um, have a role to play with our expertise and our, our proximity to our owners. Um, so those are just, just kind of a, a few things, I guess, um, I would keep an eye on. And it's not just... It's not just the expertise you can share, but it's also advocating for your, you know, CHS farmer cooperative members on some of those committees on Capitol Hill. That's all part of the discussion. It's advocating and also sharing what you guys have as far as knowledge and bringing that to the table. Exactly. Yeah. We always say that we are a partner uh, for government. Um, we are there to advise them, to be a resource for them, um, whether that is members of Congress and their staff who some of these issues might be new to, um, or whether it's USDA and, and how we can work together to implement their programs um, as best as possible. Because I know that everyone wants these programs to work well for farmers, um, and it's just a matter of working together to get there. One of the things that I honestly wanted to say is yeah, yeah. we have seen... Um, a lot of participation on the sustainability side from honestly the people that have something to sell to farmers, yes. which is not a bad thing. I don't, that's not what I mean, but we've seen a lot of big corporate interest in sustainability and trying to drive those things. The co-op system has been, you know, the farmer's sort of intermediate friend for as long as the co-op system has been here. And I don't want to, you know, I, I, I it, it's a really good thing to see the co-ops stepping into this and trying to bring some reality, maybe a little neutrality, a little balance to it. I think that's really important. I and think farmers expect that. That's a great point. It's a it's a farmer-led counterweight yeah. to perhaps some of the corporate push that not can happen. That, not that the corporate push no. is bad because it's all good, but it's still it's nice to have that that yeah. balance. Yeah. I mean, it's and within a farm bill context, that's something we've been starting to talk about a lot, especially with that kind of zero budget environment that we talked about um, is ways that partnerships can happen where just the expertise and the proximity to our owners, where can we play a role in partnership with USDA, um, filling maybe some of the gaps that they've had in something like NRCS staffing issues um, and be able to play a role there that um, better serves the, the customers at the end and the stakeholders while also not costing the taxpayers money. Um, you know, things like that are going to be really popular in this farm bill environment. Yeah, when I think of, you mentioned technical assistance earlier, yeah. and when I think of what the co-op does every single day across mm -hmm. the country, it's all technical assistance for farmers. Right. If we can bring that to the USDA, it's just going to be a win-win. I, I think that the co-op system is tailor-made for that, personally. Right. And I, I was going to add, uh, when you were talking about uh, the, the role of government, I don't know if everybody has heard about the Climate Smart Ag and Forestry Initiative. You know, the $1 billion coming 
from from the USDA to promote climate smart practices. And that's a, another great role for all of us actually to be a part of those projects. While most of the money I think has already been allocated, but the, the, the awardees, they have projects, but they don't know all the details yet of those projects. And that's where all of us can start to fill in and make sure that these programs and these projects really do go back and benefit the producers, um, you know, the cooperative system. But that's really what the, the money is there for, is to make sure that we're defining what a climate smart commodity is, that we're using real, real data, that there's a common methodology, co common calculations. And then from there, you know, we can build off of that. So that's a, I mean, I think that's a really good opportunity for all of us to be a part of that as well. All right. Any other points we want to make? Just that um, it's it's the right time for farmers to have their voice heard in policy. Um, moving into a farm bill and these issues are are hot. If you're not at the table, you might be on the menu. Um, and uh, they have a voice through CHS and they have a voice in DC. Um, and we'd love to hear from them. You know, Will, you make a really good point in that. I'm a journalist, so I'm naturally a critic. We don't expect much <laughs> out of... Congress this year. We don't expect a lot of cooperation. If the farm bill could be one of those things that we actually get done yep. as a political organization this year, it would be kind of cool. I, I think there's a lot of momentum and desire from both sides of the aisle to get something across the finish line. Like I said earlier, it's always a tight needle to thread and no farm bill is easy. Um, but, you know, the farm bill is different than a lot of pieces of legislation. It's not Ooh. just partisan lines that gets drawn on. You see geographic fights, crops crops versus crops. Um, and we worked through some of those issues and I, I think we can get a good bill. That's so true, Megan Rock. Final question to okay. you here. We're coming into Springs, Greg mentioned it's gonna be busy. Farmers are gonna have a lot of other things on their plate. What would you like them to be thinking of from a sustainability perspective as they start their 23 growing season? I, I think it would be great if we could get more information out there about what is happening on, on the farm. Uh, I, was, I was actually, I visited a, a farm in, in South Dakota, I think last, last summer, and I was joking with one of the, the younger members of the family that he needed to do a TikTok challenge, you know, or get a video out there. But in, in, in all seriousness, getting the, the message out, you know, talking about what's being done, I think if, you, if we could do that, and, and let people know that, you know, there's so much opportunity within agriculture, yes, as we all are, we all contribute to uh, the carbon footprint, but agriculture really is a big part of the solution. And we, so if we can get, if, if producers can think about that and think about how do we get their voice out to the mainstream society, you know, the, the, the young kids, my kids included, that go to the grocery store and have no idea where it comes from, you know, it just shows up. But letting, you know, the rest of society know that there's really good stuff happening on the other side of that supply chain. Um, I think that would be really fantastic and um, it might be kind of fun too. So get out there, shoot a video. If you're trying <laughs> yes. cover crops, get it out. Tell that yes. story, it sounds like. Megan, is yes. that the right attitude? I think so. Fantastic, folks. Lots to think about as we get into 2023. I want to take a minute to thank our panel. We had Will Stafford, Washington representative for CHS. Megan Rock, Chief Sustainability Officer at CHS, Greg Horsmeyer, Editor-in-Chief at DTN, and Jesse Allen from the American Ag Network. Thanks for joining us all around the table. Learn more about the benefits of cooperative ownership at cooperativeownership.com.